Hey Facebook Live, God bless you today as I bring you the Word of God. Don't forget to get your communion elements out because we are going to take communion at the end of the message. And also, don't forget to get your Bible and your pens so you can follow along. Amen? Listen, God is speaking today. He is always speaking. But sometimes we can't hear his voice for many reasons. And one of the most important reasons is that you have to remember that the voice of God, the voice of his Holy Spirit, is the voice of the Bible. So if you're not reading it, it gets kind of difficult to hear God. You know, the other day, I was going down the road, and a car came out and almost hit me. And as I looked in the rearview mirror, I saw another car. It almost hit. And so I said to myself, what's wrong with this person? And then immediately I was convicted that I should be praying for this person instead. And as I was convicted, I put convicted, I put my hand on my mouth. And in that same instant, the thought came to me, that's a scripture. I couldn't remember where it was. So I asked Google, Google, where's the scripture about putting your hand on your mouth? And sure enough, it came up that if your heart smites you or you say anything that's negative, put your hands to your mouth. So what I'm saying is, sometimes you might think you're not hearing God and he might be speaking the word. And if the word is not familiar, just put it in Google. Ask Google. Google, where is the scripture where thus and thus? One might come up, or a, a, a list of them might come up. And from that list, you read through it until the Holy Spirit says, that's the one I'm speaking to you in. So God is always speaking. Even when he is silent, he is speaking. If you have children, you'll understand this. Or if you're a teacher, or even a babysitter. So the child comes to you, and they ask you ten times, for the same thing and you said the same thing no or not now later and they keep asking over and over and after a while what do you do you might give them a threat and then you go on what silent until enough and you carry out your tr your threat so in that silence you have spoken you already said what you were going to do and what you were not going to do. And you were not going to waste your time speaking anymore. It's not that God is not going to waste his time speaking, but that's the idea I want to give you. If God is silent, search and see if he has already said something and you're refusing like a little child to accept it. Amen? So God is speaking in this hour. And all day I'm pondering exactly what he wants me to tell you because I have a, several things that I heard. So I'm going to trust him now to speak through me to you in this hour. So let's say a prayer. Father, I decree and declare your word. Let your word thunder. Let your word speak softly, whatever it has to do. Send it forth, God, and let it accomplish what it will, like the rain comes from heaven and waters the earth and brings forth fruit, food and, and fish and different things and then goes back up to you. It never returns void. So let your word accomplish fruit, bear fruit in our hearts, in our lives, in our cities, in our nation. Father, in Afghanistan, in this hour, let your word bear fruit and come alive in hearts and souls. In Jesus' name, amen. So, 
The Bible says in Exodus 34, 7, that God forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, but he will by no means clear the guilty. He visits the iniquity on the fathers of the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So in this hour, beloved, it's important that you understand this. You may be going through a trial, and your attitude is like, why does this thing keep happening over and over? Either you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, or there's a blockage in the spirit because your great, great grandparents may have done something against God that now is being visited on the family and you are feeling the effects of it. So you say, well, what do I do? This is the season, beloved, of Luke 4, 18. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus had just come out of the wilderness being tried by the enemy. And some of you may be are being tried and it's not that it's troubles it's that you're being tried for what God has for you and so I'm taking a little detour when a silversmith or a goldsmith or even a potter is forming something something that's going to be sold or used put on the shelf so everybody can see the beauty that thing has to go through fire. Listen, if the gold, if the silver, if the pottery doesn't go through fire, then the impurities will stay in the substance and what will be produced will not last. And, and I'm telling it to you a very simple way. But read up on it. Google it. Google how the silversmith works. He turns the fire up and the impurities. The silver turns to liquid. And the impurities come up to the top. And he scoops it out. And then he turns the fire up some more. And when the impurities come up, he scoops it out until when he looks in the silver. He must see his face reflected in the silver liquid as if it's a mirror. Then he knows it's fine. Same with the pottery. They put it in the fire. And they do certain things with it. Then they put it in the fire again. So you might be going through fire. Because God is purifying you. God is sanctifying you to make you that beautiful valuable vessel that he can use and listen to me too many are using their gifts the bible says in romans the gifts and the callings of god are without repentance that means the gifts that you are birthed with you might use it but your character is not formed in the fire and so your gifts may take you places that your character cannot keep you in. And too many pastors, ministers, husbands, wives are falling. And listen, when you do the things that you do that are against God, you're passing it on in the family. Just like there's physical DNA, there is spiritual DNA. Just like you see a child and you said, oh my gosh, that child is walking just like grandpa. Or you say, oh my goodness, that child looks just like great grandmother Sadie. Just like those physical features and those physical actions pass through the DNA. Same especially with the spiritual. And so you have to be careful what's in your loins. What's in your womb will pass on through the generation. So, God says, this 
is the season that you must understand where you are in the timeline of your life. Are you like Jesus, being filled with the Spirit in the end of Matthew chapter 3? When he came out of the baptism water, he was filled with the Spirit. Are you in that stage? Or are you in the next stage? Immediately the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tried of the devil. In all three of the temptations, we as humans are tried in. And he conquered it. He conquered it for us. In those three and a half years that Jesus walked the earth, he showed us how to be followers of him. How does it work? When we're filled with the Spirit, the Spirit will lead us, the Spirit will guide us, the Spirit will teach us, the Spirit will correct us, the Spirit will love on us. And there are times when the Spirit will actually lift us up and take us to the next level. Amen? I was talking to a pastor today. And she was apologizing because she was very frustrated one day and she raised her voice at me. She didn't raise her voice at me because she was mad at me. She was just frustrated. And I told her, there's no need for forgiveness. You were just going through that moment when you are in the fire and you were having those impurities scooped up out of you. Amen? Or sometimes we go through those righteous indignation like Jesus did in the temple when he got so angry that these people were using his father's pure temple for evil that he threw all the money changers out turned the tables upside down so he was having a moment a very important moment the Bible says be angry but sin not so it's okay to have a moment. Listen, when you're going through the fire, it's okay to kick and scream and kick the wall. Don't kick the dog. Don't kick your family. It's okay. God can handle it. He's not intimidated. He just says like you do with your children. Go to your room and when you feel better, we'll talk about it. But I'm not gonna talk to you right now in the mood that you're in because I might do something I shouldn't not that he would well he could but he chose not to so he's not intimidated when you kick and scream what you need to do after you're finished kicking and screaming is affirm you're still on the throne you still died for me you still empower me your word is still true I believe so help me. Amen? So sometimes the sins of the great-grandparents to the third and fourth generations are visited. And even though they are broken because of the blood, you have to affirm that brokenness. It's like this. I'm in my house, right? And the people that used to live in my house all on the electricity so now the electric company is telling me I need to pay it no I don't it's not my sin it's not my electric bill so what do I do do I just sit in my house day after day and says it's not mine I'm not paying it because I pay my bills that bill did not belong to me no, what they're going to do is turn your lights off if you don't do something. If you don't pick the phone up and call them and say, listen, this is not my bill. And if you don't give proof that that's not your bill. Amen? The same way Jesus paid for every sin that we could ever commit. He paid for the sins of your great-grandparents. But if that spiritual DNA is running rampant through the family, you can't just sit and do nothing. You have to go before the heavenly courts. 
You have to go before the judge. You have to present your case. You have to say, look, I am under the blood. You have to say, look, I belong to Christ. You have to say, look, this is what the word says legally about me. This is not mine. And I demand that it be paid in full. I demand every debt from my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, and my great-great-grandparents. I demand that every debt be paid. I tell you, I'm not paying this bill because it's not mine. I demand by the blood, by rights of the blood, by rights that he is your father, by rights that you have sonship, by rights that you can eat at the king's table. You demand in the courts of heaven that every sin that your great, great grandparents committed that is affecting you be paid for in full. Every demon they connected with, like a marriage, divorce, decrees must be granted. Everything must be paid in full. Amen? You can't just sit and think that because you were saved, that somehow the enemy is going to leave you alone. No, he won't. That's not his job. His job is to accuse. His job is to hurt. His job is to do whatever it takes to get you off the track. His job is to cause you to lose your testimony even in front of your family, even in front of your kids, in front of your co-workers. And you have to determine, no, this is not what God says. This is not what the book says. This is not what Jesus died for. So first thing that I want to encourage you is to realize the generation curses need to be broken. You need to pick up the call to Jesus. And that's why I put in the description some sessions about by Robert Henderson about approaching the courts of heaven. So I'll put the links in the description. There are four sessions that he did. There's also one that's called Jump the Bloodline by Dr. Miles Munro. Take time to watch these. Take time to learn about it. Take time to look at the scriptures about it. It says in Daniel chapter 9, I'm going to go down to that and read it. Hallelujah. In Daniel chapter 9, we see the courts of heaven operating. Hold a second. I'll get to it. Daniel chapter 9. God is so good and he loves you. He cares about you. And he wants to see your life filled with goodness. He says in John 10.10, 10, I came to give you life. And that more abundantly. Amen. So in Daniel chapter 9. We see the courts of heaven operating. And I'm taking time to find Daniel chapter 9. Because I didn't plan to read it. But I want to show you the courts of heaven in Daniel 9. All right, here we go. So it says in Daniel chapter 9, all right, I'll bring that to you in a minute. I want to bring it to you and read that for you. Daniel chapter 9. Um, with the courts of heaven. And I'll bring that for you in a minute. So let me continue to talk to you in the meantime. In the meantime, I want to talk to you 
about something else. So we talked about the generation curses passing on. We talk about the fact that like if somebody owes a debt that they're claiming is now yours, you have to prove in a court of law, in a legal system, that no, it's not mine. And we have to do the same in the spirit. Amen? So, the next thing I want to talk to you is this. We have choices that we have to make. God, God is not going to change his law. Listen, no matter what you feel like, no matter what you think, no matter what, God is not intimidated. He's not going to be manipulated. He's never going to change his law to suit your beliefs. And even though we want to have compassion and love on every person in the world, because he did, he so loved the world, not just the good people, but every human being in the world, no matter what station they're in, no matter where they came from, God died for every one of them. It said he loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, he so loved the world, every person, every human, the whomsoever. And because of the generation curses, because great-grandparents and their great-grandparents opened the door, opened the door to so much evil to come into the family, it's like a squatter. A squatter, the other day I was watching where a squatter Listen, the squatter is in this person's house and they cannot go into the house and live in it. Even though they bought the house legally and it's theirs, they couldn't go in the house until they go to a court of law and fight that case. And even so, it was difficult for them. And that's what happens to these familiar spirits they come into the family and then they behave as if somehow they own the family and they're so used to it <laughs> i was reading something just today and it says you know a friend comes to your house that you don't like anymore and he says hey can i stay on your couch you says no well i'm tired can i at least sit on the porch Okay, fine. And then later they knock on the door and says, Listen, it's really cold out here. Can I have a blanket? And then they said, Well, can I just come by the door? And then eventually, because it's your friend or because your heart, for whatever reason, is reaching out to this person, even though you don't want to, next thing you know, they're in your house. Once they're in your house, you're going to have a hard time getting them out. And that's just the way it is. That's just the way life is. And it's the same with these spirits. Okay, I know why I couldn't find Daniel. Because it wasn't Daniel 9. It was Daniel 7, 9. Not Daniel 9. So, in, in, so now, again, you have to legally get these things out of the family. And what gave us the legal right, the authority, is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus conquered every sin. The Bible says he conquered the death and hell. The last thing to be conquered, it's already one, is death. When he comes to that last day and say death, Where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Everything is conquered. Every enemy is conquered. So Daniel 7, 9 and 10 says this. I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days, that's God, took his seat. So see that court. 
here are thrones set up. And then the judge comes in, the ancient of days, his, and took his seat. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was flames of fire. Its wheels were burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out before him. A thousand thousands were attending him, and ten thousand times ten thousand were standing before him. Now remember, if you've ever gone into court, everybody has to rise. And then the judge comes in and takes his seat. So here we see the Ancient of Days comes in, takes his seat, while 10,000 times 10,000 were standing. And then the court was seated and the books were opened. Isn't that exactly how it happens in a natural? As in a natural, so in the spiritual. This is the heavenly courts with the highest heavenly judge of the universe, God himself. And remember, he paid the price with his precious blood for you to be set free. Amen? So, it's very important that you understand the Isaiah 61 which Jesus quoted in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 after he was tried he went into the temple and he said this the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to point unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them Beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old ways. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities. The desolation of many generations. That's a generation curse that passed on. That is causing even Chicago right now. The crime rate. The murder is so high. Right now in Afghanistan. I haven't watched the news today. But yesterday they said it's almost three thirds taken over by the Taliban. God conquered every evil. And he's saying, this anointing is upon me. But listen, because the anointing was on Jesus to do all this. He's saying, now that you serve me, now that I'm in you, then that anointing is in you. And when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, that anointing is upon you. But he's declaring and decreeing. This day, this hour, this anointing is being refreshed. This anointing that comes upon you, no matter what station you are, God is saying, I'm anointing you to break the generation curses. I'm anointing you to stand up and be counted. Amen? In, and I'm going to tell you a little more about that. In Joel chapter 2, we see God's army. 
at first, I, as I was reading it, I was wondering, what in the world is this group? It said they they don't break rank. And no matter what you do, they don't move. And I knew there had to be a spiritual army that you could not conquer. You could see it. You could see the evidence of what this army was doing, but they could not be conquered. And in Joel chapter 2, verse 11, it said it's the Lord's army. And that the Lord will utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executed his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Listen, this is the God we serve. This God that has an army. And I want you to read the book of Joel chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11 and see how that army operates. That army is on your side. If you are serving God, that army is on your side to conquer every evil. And that's what the Lord says in Joel chapter 2. Turn your heart back to me. He says, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, turn back to me. He says, rend your heart and not your garments. He says, I'm gracious and I'm merciful. I'm slow to anger and of great kindness and repent and will turn from every evil. This, this God loves you so much that he is ready, he is willing to say enough in your life, enough in your family's life, whatever you're dealing with right now. It says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breath, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride from out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of God, Weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. Do not give your people your heritage to reproach. Don't let the heathen, don't let the enemy rule over your people. Why should the people say about us, Where is your God? And so as we cry out to God, he will hear. It says in verse 18 of Joel 2, he will be jealous. He will be jealous for his people and pity his people. Yes, the Lord will answer his people. He said, I will send you corn. I will send you wine. I will send you oil. That's the riches. He said, you shall be satisfied with it. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. And I will remove far from you all this, all that cause you to be barren. All that cause you to be desolate. He says, fear not. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do great things. He says he will restore the years of the locusts, the years of the canker worm, the years of the caterpillar, the years of the palmer worm. He said, my great army. He sent the army because the people would not listen. The people would not obey. The people would not do right. He says, my army, which I sent, he says, I will restore everything that my army took from you. When you think of the canker worm or the caterpillar and the locust, they eat all the grain. They eat everything bare. So you're left with no food, no money because you can't sell your food. So you're left desolate. He says, when you cry 
out to me with a heart that's pure and clean and says, spare your people, God. He said, I will restore. He says, and you will know that I'm in the midst of you. And I love this part. He said in verse 28 of Joel 2, and it shall come to pass afterward. It shall come to pass afterward. After what word? After I restore you. After I restore your finances. After I restore your health. After I restore your relationship. He said, afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon my servants, my male servants, and also upon my female servants, I will pour out my spirit. This is what's happening in this hour, beloved. And we've got to get involved. We've got to stop languishing. We got to shake ourselves from the dust and realize he did it for us. All we have to do is say, I believe, I do. And he'll do the rest. As you reach out to him, he'll do the rest. God wants us to live right. He will bless us. He cannot help it. He doesn't always randomly just punish us and hit us on the head. That's not the God. That's the God they've told you exists. That is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible sacrificed himself. The God of the Bible allowed them to murder him so he can take the punishment that we deserve. Greater love, greater love has no man than that. That he should lay his life down for those he loved. Greater love, no man. He doesn't randomly just want to punish us. Listen to this. Think. Let me give you a scenario. So, I have a set of children. And all year I plan at the end of the year for Christmas, I'm going to spend five hundred dollars on each of my kids i planned it i budgeted it i sacrificed and so at the end of the year they each get three or four things with the five hundred dollars so i tell my child one of my children i said to that child i said when school is over i want you to come right home what did that child do that shall listen to a friend, got on the bus without my permission, without telling me, got on the bus, went into a neighborhood with this friend, a neighborhood that we struggled to get out of, so that what happened to him that night, a group of young men surrounded him, beat him up, and took away his electronic device right okay can we blame God for that I mean honestly can we blame God for that did he get blessed did I bless him but his disobedience caused him to lose so when he comes home I punish him and I told him, I said, you're grounded. I don't want you to hang with this young man. He's lost one of his gifts that I suffered. You know, me and the father suffered to purchase. That same child, grounded, told not to hang with that friend, snuck out his window, got on his bike that we bought him for Christmas, Rode to meet the friend somewhere, and again, something happened. They stole his bike, but this time they stole his shoes also. So his friend runs away. 
So now what happened? Luckily, they didn't take his little phone. So he calls. He needs help. He doesn't know how to get home. He doesn't have any shoes to get home. So we go pick him up. He went into the enemy's territory by disobeying us. He came out of under our protection. Can we blame God for that? I mean, really, can we? He was blessed just like all his siblings. He was blessed, but he chose to do wrong. And so God is pouring out his blessings in this hour. And a lot of people are choosing to do wrong, to come out from under God's protection and still they've got the nerve to say things like, why are you doing this to me? He's not doing it. I didn't do, I and his father didn't do anything to that young man when he got in trouble. We're not the ones that caused it to happen. We're not the ones that caused his bike to get stolen, his electronic device to get stolen, his sneakers to get stolen. We're not the ones, he lost all his Christmas gifts. Our hard-earned $500, he lost it all by disobeying. It was not our fault. We did everything we could to, to, to turn him in the right way. Same with God, even more so with God. We have to stay under his protection. Now, you might say, well, that child shouldn't get anything. But you've got to remember this. The Bible says in Romans 2, 4, the goodness, you need to know that the goodness of God leads to repentance. It reminds me of a story I heard. I don't know if it's Sandy Patty or Twyla Paris. She said she did something wrong. And the mother says, wait till your dad comes home. You're going to get it. And so she's so scared. And here comes the dad. And the mom told the dad what she did. And the dad takes her and tells her, let's walk down to the corner store. Tells her to choose any candy that she wants. And then when they were done, they sit on the stoop of the store to chat. She said that was the worst punishment she ever got. That this father loved her so much that he would overlook what she did to focus on who she was. That his love did not end because she did wrong. That his love did not depend on what she did, but on what's in his heart. And that's how God sees us. He loves us so much. In this hour, he wants our childhood wounds to be healed. Listen, our children are suffering so much. Childhood sex trafficking, babysitters raping them, going through so much. No, it's not what God wants. And people say, why doesn't God do something? God give us this earth. He give it to us to take care of. If I give you my car legally, do I have a right to come whenever I feel like it with my spare key and drive your car off? No. If I give you my house legally, do I have the right to take my spare key, come into your house, get into your bed that used to be mine, Whenever I want? No, because that's yours legally. Same way, God give us this earth legally. So now, for him to do something about what's happening around us, we have to give him the legal authority, the power of a attorney to act on our behalf. We have to pray. We have to follow his law. And when we do, he acts on our behalf, protecting us, keeping us. That's just the way it works. 
He loves us. And his heart is breaking with so much that's going on with our children that is keeping that door open for the enemy to come in and move on through the family. And it has to stop. Our children are precious and need to be protected. Amen? This sex trafficking, this using our children for porn, it's got to stop. Our children, my friend read me something this morning or last night. I can't remember when she came and she said some man just killed his two children because he said they're going to affect the world negatively. How? You were probably touched as a child by someone in ways that you should not. You see, we as parents must touch our children's will and teach them to come under subjection to our will. The only commandment with a promise is commandment five that says, children, obey your parents in the Lord that you may live long. The only commandment out of the ten that has that promise. So we train our children, keep them in the right path. So sometimes we have to discipline them. But you don't touch their spirit. You never touch a child's spirit. When you touch them sexually, you touch their spirit. Their spirit belongs to God. And when you do touch them that way, you come under God's judgment. You open the door to evil to come in and infect that child. So we need to be healed from those wounds. And we need to go to the courts of heaven and take authority over any generation curse that's passed through because of wounds, because of spirits that have been opened, the door's been opened. Old wounds need to be healed. So, I want to come to the end and tell you this. In Hosea chapter 14, verse 1, God said, O Israel, return unto your God. For you have fallen by your iniquity. What is iniquity of the family? Or what is you yourself? He paid for it. He paid for it. Every transgression. Every iniquity. He paid for it by his blood. He says come back. And I'm giving you that invitation today. Come back to the Lord. He says in verse 2 of Hosea 14. Take with your words and turn to the Lord say to him Lord take away all my iniquity Lord receive us graciously so we will render the fruit of our lips to you Asher can't save us the things of the world can't save us and he says in verse 4 of Hosea 14, I will heal your backsliding. I will love you freely. For my anger will turn away from you. And he says this, and I love this. And your branches shall spread. And your beauty shall be as an olive tree. And your smell as Lebanon. And they that dwell in your shadow shall return so because you turn to the Lord and he pours his goodness out on you, you in turn cause others to be blessed and come in to the same. The Bible says in Joel chapter 3, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, multitudes. So you coming back to the Lord, you taking him at his word. You receiving what he's done for you will not only benefit you and your family, but you become a living epistle that men could read, 
that others can come in and be blessed. This is the last day that we are in. And God is saying, multitudes in the valley, multitudes, multitudes. He says he wants you to get to that place in Hosea 14, 8, where you say, I'm going to have nothing more to do with these idols I've set up. I will have nothing more to do with the evil that I did. Who is wise and will understand these things that I've said today? Who's prudent and will know them? For the ways of the Lord are right. And the just shall walk in God's ways. But the transgressors shall fall. So I want to come to the end and tell you this. You've got to make a choice. You can't sit in between. You can't keep running for help everywhere. You have to turn to God. You just have to. And those of you who claim that you're going through things in your body, that says you're not who God created you to be anymore? Make a choice. The Bible says, and I like this, in Matthew 19, 12, there are some eunuchs which were born as eunuchs from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake because they love the Lord. They choose to be eunuchs. They choose not to live by what their body dictates. That word eunuch, it also describes somebody who kept the women in the Bible. They kept the women. It's a chamberlain. And one of the reasons why is because they've been emasculated. They've been incapacitated so they cannot marry or have children. They've been deliberately castrated by men or voluntarily they decide, I'm going to abstain. I am going to choose God. I'm going to choose God. And I'm, and I'm encouraging you today. God's not going to change his laws for you. Because it's changed in America and some places around the world. It doesn't move God. God doesn't say, oh, well, look what they did. No. God says, this is what I said and this is how it's going to be. Period. But he's done so much to show his love. Even by dying for us. So I'm encouraging you. Choose. Choose God today. True love equals sacrifice true love that's why marriages are not working because we want to have our needs met we're not thinking about the other person we don't want to endure to cause them to come to god no you will do it my way you will please me or i'll find somebody else no that's not love that's selfishness that's narcissism True love equals sacrifice. And he never asks us to do anything that he hasn't done first. What did he do first? God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He sacrificed. He literally allowed them to murder him on the cross. He gave. That's what love does. So we need to choose. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, no one should seek his own good, but the good of others. He did it first. He showed us how. So, again, I'm coming to the end. This is the hour of Luke 4, 18. This is the hour of of Luke 4.18, and I keep, I keep hearing it in my spirit. 
August the 14th, August the 14th, and I'm like, God, what does it mean? And I'm su- I'm not surprised that today is 8.14, and I'm telling you this is the hour of 4.18. It's backward, but this is confirmation. This is the hour of Luke 4.18. And, and here, God always confirms it by Showing me a situation, putting me in a situation. Last night, well, it was 8.12, I listened to the Elisha streams and Johnny Enlow. He gave a, a wonderful description of what God is doing in this hour. Luke 4.18 is what Jesus quoted after he came out of the wilderness. He quoted Isaiah 61, 1 to 4. So I'm going to end with this, and I want you to really hear me. So we talked about getting rid of generation curses by going to the courts of heaven. And I put some links in the description where you can see a couple of videos about the courts of heaven. We talked how childhood wounds need to be healed because they perpetrate that generation curse. When we open the doors the familiar spirits and then we talked about choices we have to make to show true love so now I want to come with this to you God wants to bless you but he wants you to be a blessing in this hour he's called you to walk in Luke 418 which is really Isaiah 61 1 to 4 it's an anointing of God that's released. And I love Johnny Enlow's. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about what he said right now because it's true. Some of you are going to get sudden tears as a sign that God has anointed you with the Luke 4 18 anointing from Isaiah 61, 1 to 4. The sudden tears are a sign that God has just anointed you to set the captive free. He's given you a strong anointing to mend broken hearts and to help those who mourn. And this is the hour when many are mourning because of COVID. So many are losing loved ones. So many are losing loved ones. God has given you that Isaiah 4.18, sorry, Luke 4.18, Isaiah 61, 1 to 4, anointing by the sudden tears you either getting right now or you'll get soon because you have an anointing to set the captive free, to mend the broken hearts, and to comfort those who mourn. The second part of that anointing you're going to numbness in your right hand suddenly or it's going to shake to prove that God has given you an anointing of Luke 4.18 to supernaturally restore whole cities. You're going to walk into cities like Chicago and different places and you're going to suddenly know what to say. Speak into the atmosphere. Once you speak those words into the atmosphere, God's mighty army who are waiting for those words are going to move these spirits of murder in Chicago. Yes, they're spirits. It's a spiritual thing. And it's affecting people because they're buying into it. And God is going to give you anointing to speak Speak to cities to be healed. And proof of it is a sudden shaking in your right hand or a numbness, a warmth, or a cold. Something is going to happen in that right hand. And the third part of this Luke 4.18 anointing that comes from Isaiah 61, 1 to 4, is your feet are going to get numb or cold or hot. Something is going to happen in your feet right now or sometime tonight. They're going to show 
that God has given you the Luke 4, 18 anointing in this hour to encourage people by your voice, by the words that come out of your mouth. You're going to make declarations. Remember, the earth is ours, and we have to give him power of attorney to work. So the Holy Spirit is going to give you things to declare into the atmosphere. And when you declare it, it's going to happen. Because immediately the angels and God's army are going to rush to fix that thing. You're not, don't do it randomly. You have to hear the Holy Spirit. It's like when Caleb and the other spies came, all the spies could see was that they were grasshoppers and there were giants in the land. Caleb and Joshua said, no, we can take them. Because they didn't see themselves as grasshoppers. They saw themselves like David saw himself with the Goliath. And that's the anointing that you're having in this hour. So let me go over it right quick. Sudden tears. Luke 4.18. To mend the broken hearts. To set the captive free. And for those who mourn. To comfort them. Something in your right hand, numbness or shaking or fire, to supernaturally restore whole cities. That means whole families. And in the third part of the anointing of Luke 4.18 from Isaiah 61, 1 to 4, is numbness in your feet or some fire in your feet or coldness. Somehow your feet is going to let you know that God has given you, how lovely on the mountains are those who bring good news. Your feet is prepared, prepared with the gospel of the peace. So I encourage you, turn to your God. Get the Bible out. That's God's voice. The Lord speaks in the Bible language. And if you don't know it, it's hard to hear what he's saying. Amen? So I decree and declare over you to look for 18 anointing, to break generation curses, to heal the wounds of childhood, to cause whole cities to come into alignment with God's word, to, to cause those that hurt and mourn, to cause a captive to be set free in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. It's time for me to go. I do have a lot of names that I wrote down. I want to remind you to use the links that I've put to watch Jump the Line to Break Generational Curses, Dr. Miles, I'm sorry, Francis Miles, and then the Courts of Heaven, there are four sessions, Robert Henderson. I'm also going to put in the description the link to Johnny Enlow so that you can listen to this again about the anointing. Amen? So let's take communion. Before supper was ended, 1 Corinthians 11 I'm reading from, verse 26. Before supper was ended, he took the bread. He blessed it and gave thanks. And then he said, take, eat. This is my body, the same Jesus who conquered the enemy in the wilderness and who declared the anointing, the Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me. That same Jesus is now anointing you. Eat. And then the same manner he took the cup. After they supped, and when he gave thanks, he said, This is the covenant in my blood, because he conquered every enemy by his blood. Now you have the anointing by him, with him, to go forth and conquer the enemy. Amen? I hear the name Michael. Now, I know a lot of Michaels. 
And God is, I, I don't know what he's saying, so I have to trust. Because all I have is the name. <clears throat> God said, Michael, you give your heart to me as a child. He says, once you give your heart to me, Michael, you are born again. And just like a man cannot deny his child, he can do it verbally. But the DNA shows 99.999% that that child is his. I'm not denying you, Michael. You are mine. You gave your heart to me. And no matter what you've done, I love you. I choose to put my love on you. My love for you is strong and eternal. It has nothing to do, Michael, with what you did or what you haven't done. My love for you is everlasting. So I plead with you, come and eat from my love. Come and drink from my love. Don't sit there and wonder why everything is going wrong. It's because you're not availing yourself of my love, Michael. Come, come back to me. I'm calling you back to my heart. Child, you are mine, Michael. And then I hear Cree. Cree. I hear the Lord saying he wants you to use your voice for him. I don't know if you've got a singing voice or if you act. Or if you just do speeches like poems or whatever. But God said, I have given you the mouth, the tongue of a ready writer. He says, Cree, I called you by name. Child, you are mine. And in this hour, I want to use your voice to help set the captives free. Amen? And then I hear marcellus, marcellus. I see you lifting heavy things. I don't know if you're a, um, a longshoreman or what they call a stevedore or if you are a long-term trucker or working at a warehouse where you lift heavy things. I see you lifting heavy things. And I hear God saying to you, Marcellus, I too use my hands as a carpenter. And so as you're lifting those heavy things, as you're doing your work, I want you to remember your hands, your hands are anointed by me, Marcellus, to do my work. I need your hands to be my hands in the earth. So he's saying, I'm anointing your hands merciless to speak to cities and see it turn around. Amen? And then I hear BV. BV? BV or Bevy. God said, child, I love you. Why doubt? Don't you see all around you? The heavens declare the glory of God. I love you. And it's no time for you to waste wondering why. Come to me, BV. Let me fill those empty places with me. I am able. I am the answer, BV. I have need for you. I have need for those prayers. I have need. I see you in the quiet of the evening. When everybody is sleeping, you are speaking to God. God says, I hear your prayers. He says, BV, remember when you prayed for, I think I hear Michael, when you prayed and what I did, that was because of your prayers. I'm hearing them. So keep trusting. Keep coming to me, BV. And then I hear Charlemagne. Charlemagne, Charlie, Charlie Maine, God called you. I don't know if you're a hair stylist, if you do things with hair, or I'm just seeing, um, maybe you ride horses, because I'm seeing, you know, the, know that the women wear the, they call them a horse tail, um, but 
God knows your name. God knows your name, Charlemagne. And he's saying, it's time. It's time for you to trust me. It's time for you to get up out of the depression you're in. The depression you're in are doors that have been opened up by your family. He says, come to me and let me break it. Because I've already paid the price through my blood. And I have need for you in this hour, Charlemagne. I have need for you. I hear the British are coming. The British are coming. How they rode on the horses and took messages. So, so many were saved. That's what I see that you are. Not that you're going to ride horses, but that you have that anointing with your voice to speak into atmospheres like the watchman on the wall sees the enemy coming and, and, and sound the alarm. Charlemagne, God said, your voice will sound the alarm for many. Time is short and they need to come out of the valley of decision. Amen? And then I hear Mercury. Mercury or Mercury. God said, Mercury, Mercury. I think you're a runner um, because I just suddenly saw the Olympics. And so you're either a runner. I, I, I see Calvin, Calvin. I don't know if Calvin is somebody you run with. God said, I need to use you as my messenger. I need you to go and prepare your feet with the preparation of the gospel. I need you to go because there are many who are going to say how lovely are the feet of those who bring good news and you are one of them. Amen. And then I hear busser, 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 busser. I see you with a waiter of glasses on it. I don't know if you work at a restaurant or you own a restaurant, God said, Busser, you are mine. He said, people might look down on you. He says, well, what you do is important to me. He says, Busser, you've caused so many with your words to come into my kingdom. He says, but you have to educate yourself about the things that that I want you to know about me and therefore to know about you so you can do it with confidence. There is need for more. I hear thousands. God wants to use you to bring in. Amen. And then Miriam, dancer, you're a dancer. Because as soon as I said Miriam, I saw Moses' sister shaking the tambourine and dancing. God said, I give you the dance. And I hear choreography. He's going to give you some moves in the night in choreography that will become a blessing to the people who see it. And then I hear Julia. And, and when I heard the word Julia, Child came up with it. And I don't know if he's saying that your name is Julia Child or he's saying Julia child like julia my child he's referring to you as his child he says you have sonship with him and you understand that word julia he says you understand but something has happened in the last couple of years that has caused you to begin to doubt and he's saying listen don't doubt remember all the things that happened around you that you knew I did, do like David. It says David encouraged himself in the Lord. And sometimes God said, Julia, you just have to be alone because there's nobody who can walk the walk that you walk. You're not crazy, Julia. I called you to walk this lonely road. He says, when it gets too hard, look for the way of escape. I'll send you a way of escape. He says, there are times when I'll come myself or I'll send my messengers. But Julia, hold on. Hold on. Don't doubt. Don't doubt. And then 
I hear Meiji or when I heard it, I tried to spell it. And I'm looking back at it now and I'm not sure I can remember like Meiji, 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 Meiji. I heard your name twice. I heard it in the in towards the end and I heard it again. When your name is called twice, it reminds me of Samuel. When Samuel's name was called and he didn't understand, he thought it was Eli. And when his name was called again, he still thought it was Eli. And Eli says, No, that's not me. God is calling you. Meiji, I heard your name twice. God said you like a Samuel. He says many people around you in your family and, and, and maybe where you worship, they have not heard God's voice openly. He says, but you have. And he says, you're not crazy. I am speaking to you. I have need for you. And I see the scripture in in 1st Corinthians 12 or the 2nd Corinthians 12 it's one of the 12 where Paul asks the Lord remove this thing from me and he asked three times and God said no because my grace is sufficient for you because your weakness is made strong in my strength and I hear God saying that to you Meiji that you need to trust him even in your weakness the reason why he allowed you to be weak is because he wants you to depend on him because once you depend on him then the things that you speak will be what he speaks and he will back it up a hundred percent amen and then i hear pager um pager or page i think they call you pager well it sounds like pager and God is saying, I've called you since you are a child. He says, I've called you from your mother's womb. It seems like your mother loved the Lord and prayed for you, Pager. It seems like she couldn't get pregnant. And I see Hannah in the temple. And Hannah said, Lord, if you'll give me a child, I'll give that child to you. And that's what your mom said, Pager. And God says, you're mine. He says, I love you. I want to bless you. I want to bless you beyond your understanding so that you in turn can be a blessing pager. So get with your God. Amen. And then I hear Marcel. And then and then it sounds like Markel. Maybe it's both. Marcel, Markel. I hear God saying, I see fishermen. I don't know what it has to do with fish, but I see suddenly the story where Peter said, I, I fished all night. Here's this experienced fisherman who fished all night. And he said, I got nothing. And Jesus said, let your nets down. And he's like, here's this man telling me, an experienced fisherman, to let my nets down. But something moved in him and he said, okay, because you said it, I'll do it. But he only let one net down. He didn't let nets down like God said. So he didn't fully obey. But that one net that he let down had so many fish. I think it said 150. There were so many of them that it caused this boat to almost be drowned that they had to send for another boat to help bring all that fish in. And so, Marcel, Markel, God is saying, I have made you a fisher of men. He says, you're going to be one like Benny Hinn to stand before thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions. And it's time. It's time that you heed the call. It's time that you learn about your gift directly from the Lord, him and the Holy Spirit. Marcel Markel and the final name I have is Mabel Mabel I think when 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 I hear the name Mabel I think of a song 
and I don't know if you're a singer, Mabel, or if you are a babysitter, if you're a grandmother that cares for little children and you sing them lullabies, God said, you're not too old. He says, no, 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 I'm not done with you. He says, I haven't even started fully. You must avail yourself. He says, every child that you lay your hand on and you bless, it sets a shield around them from the enemy. He says, Mabel, don't doubt your power and the anointing that's in your hand and in your voice. You're changing cities just by changing one child. And I hear Billy Graham. Whoever got Billy Graham saved, one man has touched so many people. And it's the same with you. It might seem like you're not doing much for me. But when you touch that one child, that one child can change cities, change countries, change families, and time is running out. Amen? Listen, God bless you. I hope that you were blessed. The names that were called, it's just not for them. It's for you also. So if something resounded inside of you, grab a hold of it. I'm going to tell you this last thing because it came to me Sean Boltz he says whenever he hears these prophecies or he sees God do something great he says I want that and this is why he says his father came home one day and took his sister shopping and when his sister came back with the bag all he wanted to see was the receipt and I thought that was funny but this is what he said he says, when I look at that receipt, I said, uh-huh, I am going to get the same amount or more. He says, I claimed what's on that receipt. So there was like, for instance, $500 spent on that receipt. He says, I know my father is going to take me out when it's my turn, and he's going to spend at least $500 on me or more. He says, so I claimed the ticket, and that's what I want you to do. Every time you hear a prophecy come forth for somebody else, claim it for you. It says if Father is giving them that, then I'm getting that and much more. Because he says he's no respecter of persons. He says he loves you just the same. Amen? So God bless you. Wednesday, our blessed apostle, Torrance, and maybe his wife, Torrance Press, Apostle Press, is going to bring the message. And I'm excited to hear what he's going to say to you. So God bless you, and I'll see you next Saturday. Amen? Bye, Leslie. Hi, Godiva. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Christine. God bless you.